those two, when you're looking at a whole cardiac MRI, you can see the whole 3D volume, so cardiac MRI is better. Also, in a lot of patients who may be obese or have COPD, they have very poor acoustic windows and it's very tough to get good quality images. And even in the best of hands, you'll see that whereas the left ventricle is a fairly spherical or conical object that is easy to quantify the size and shape, the RV is more elongated and more elliptical structure, so it's very difficult for them to accurately quantify RV volume and function on echo. So that's why cardiac MRI remains a gold standard. Another thing that can, cardiac MRI can do is we can show the presence of scar. In patients who've had previous myocardial infarctions, the dead tissue over time will develop into scar. And we can see these on the late gadolinium enhancement images. And by looking at the extent of the scar and how much viable tissue is left over, it helps the clinicians decide whether or not these patients will benefit from getting revascularization through either coronary artery stenting or cabbage. And the presence of scar can also lead to arrhythmias or irregular heartbeats in these patients. And being able to pinpoint exactly where these irregular heartbeats are coming from will help the clinicians target and ablate those areas and help eliminate the arrhythmias. Also, cardiac MRI is commonly used in the evaluation of heart failure of unknown origin. There's a lot of disease processes other than than coronary artery disease that can lead to heart failure. And in cardiac MRI, by showing the types of delayed enhancement patterns, it can help guide the clinicians as to what is the underlying cause of the heart failure. In cardiac MRI, because we have great 3D images, we can, it is great to look at congenital heart diseases in which the connections between the chambers and the great vessels can be very strange, but we can measure flows across all those different chambers and vessels and help guide the management. And lastly, cardiac MRI is also great in the evaluation of cardiac masses because we can get a sense of the T1 <coughs> images. We can get the T1 signal, the T2 signal, and any enhancement, and that can help us categorize what type of cardiac mass we may be dealing with. And next, we're going to go over some relevant anatomy and imaging claims. So when we start off with the scalp of the patient in the axial bright bloods, we can see the cardiac chambers. We can see the right atrium, the right ventricle, left atrium, and left ventricle. But because the heart is oriented a little bit obliquely within the chest, you're not perfectly cutting through the heart in a way that you can optimize you can optimally evaluate the anatomy or the function. So we'll have to get some cardiac specific planes to look at the anatomy. So to start, we'll put a plane across the left atrium and left ventricle like this, and that will help us get the vertical long axis or the two chamber view. It is so named because we will see the left atrium here and the left ventricle there. And then the different parts of the left ventricle also has, have names. The part that's closer to the left atrium is referred to as the base. And the wall that's on the other side, the more pointy end, that's the apex. The wall that's immediately above the diaphragm, that's the inferior wall. And the wall on the other side, that's the anterior wall. And then next, we take our vertical long axis, and then we put slices across the perpendicular to this imaginary line down the center, and then we can get a stack of short axis images. These short axis, the left ventricle will look round like a circle, and the right ventricle will look elliptical or crescent shaped next to the left ventricle. <coughs> and then we also have different names for different parts of the the ventricle. So the wall that, located, that is located between the left ventricle and the right ventricle, that's referred to as the septal wall. The wall on the other side, that's free, that's the lateral wall. The 
The wall then sits on top of the diaphragm, that's the inferior wall, and the other side is the anterior wall. And then next, we take the short axis, and then we cut across like this, and then now we can truly get a four-chamber image, because we can see all four chambers very clearly. The right atrium, the right ventricle, left atrium, and left ventricle. And we can also see the valve very clearly. The valve separating the right atrium and right ventricle is referred to as the tricuspid valve. And the valve that's in between the left atrium and left ventricle, that's the mitral valve. And then again, the wall that is in between the left ventricle and the right ventricle, that's called the septum. And then the out of the free wall is the lateral. And we also can divide the heart in thirds with the part that's closer to the atria that's referred to as the base of the heart. The pointy end is the apex, and then the portion in between, that's the mid cavity. And in a lot of cases, we also get what is called the LVOT, or left ventricular outflow tract view, in which we cut across the short axis like so. And the reason we do this is we want to look at the blood flow that goes from the left atrium into the left ventricle and how it moves out into the aorta. In some patients, such as patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, the muscle here gets too thick within the left ventricle, and the blood has to basically sneak by the thickened septum and then go into the aorta, and that can cause obstruction. And this LVOT view is very good at showing that degree of obstruction. And next, we're going to talk about some very common pulse sequences that are common to most standard cardiac MRI protocols. We're going to talk about the black blood images, bright blood, perfusion, delayed enhancement, and phase contrast. Black blood images are obviously called black blood because the blood is black. And you can see that the myocardium is this intermediate gray, and you can see that the fat is not suppressed in this, in this black blood images. And we can see very high level of anatomic detail. We can see the myocardium very nicely. We can see sharply the interface of the, between the blood pool and the myocardium. We can see the epicardial fat very nicely, and in some of the conditions, such as the uh, condition we see commonly here at Hopkins, the arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia, a lot of the times people do pay attention and see if there's abnormal fat infiltration there, and these black blood images can be very helpful for that. The black blood images are also called double IR images, and that's because there are two 180 degree inversion pulses. The, one, the first 180 degree inversion pulse inverts all of the spins within the imaging volume, but the second 180 degree pulse is slice selective, and then so it restores the signal of the myocardium within that slice, but then the blood that's moving from outside the slice will pass through the null point as it comes into your slice so that the signal from the incoming blood will be black. And these are ECG-gated spin echo sequences, and they can be made either T1 weighted, in which you would set the TR to every R to R interval, or they can be set to be more T2 weighted, in which the TR will equal to every two R R intervals. You can also add an additional 180 degree pulse to know the fat to make it a triple IR, and those can be helpful to look at edema such as this example here, that we have a triple IR. So now we have also saturated the signal from the fat. So now any edema or water signal is going to be very conspicuous. So if you look at the heart here, the myocardium on the septum side is kind of that normal intermediate gray. But when you look at the lateral wall, is much brighter, and that's because there is presence of edema in this patient with myocarditis. And you can also look for fat as well. 
the workhorse of a lot of these cardiac MRI sequences are these bright blood cell images in which you usually look at the short axis images, we scroll through the whole stack, and we can assess whether or not the walls are contracted normally, are they contracting and thickening normally, and how is the, the ejection fraction, is a lot of the numbers that we care about, and whether the, the heart is adequately squeezing the blood out of the heart. So these are commonly go by a couple of trade names, either TrueFist for Siemens, Fiesta, or BFFE for Spirits. They are the big balance that is day free procession sequences, and they have the highest signal to noise per imaging time of all currently available sequences. And these are when we usually do the retrospective gating so that we can then post process these images and calculate numbers that we care about, like the volumes and function of the heart. These are very short TR and TE, and they're very fast sequences. That's why we can do the dynamic imaging and look at the function. And we'll, we also want to make sure that we have adequate temporal resolution. Ideally, you want the temporal resolution to be between 30 to 60 milliseconds so that you can adequately evaluate the cardiac function and also any and the load flows through the heart. The contrast is proportional to the T1, to the, to the T2 to T1 ratio. And usually in these cynic images that are retrospectively gated, we obtain one slice per breath hold, and we can use those to quantify things. But in some types, if your patient is a really poor breath holder, then instead of doing retrospective gating, we can perform uh, these sequences will be real time, in which you basically are not really gating the sequences, you just have the machine on the whole time and you just obtain lower resolution but faster images so that you can still get a subjective sense of the function of the heart. These balanced SSFP images are great in terms of signal, but they have they are more sensitive to field inhomogeneity especially at 3T compared to the older sequences, which are the spoiled GLE sequences. So in patients who may have implants, metallic implants or devices, the spoiled GLE sequences may work better for them. And as I said, after you get this stack of short axis images, then you post-process them by drawing these circles at the myocardial and blood pool interface so you can calculate things such as the end diastolic volume, end systolic volume, and injection fraction. I used to spend hours and hours doing this kind of work for my research project as well, but then now I just let the residents and fellows do it and I say good, good, excellent. <laughs> so it's, it's good that I'm no longer in training. And then next we do perfusion. At Hopkins, we usually don't stress the, the patient, so we usually just obtain perfusion and rest. These are basically very fast images that you're watching as the blood is coming into the heart. So, in this case, we have a stress perfusion in which they stress the patient with pharmacologic agents to basically make the heart work work harder. So if there's any underlying coronary artery disease, that extra degree of stress may break it out. So in this case, if you see on the still images, there's this black line in the myocardium, and that shows that that part of the myocardium is not receiving enough blood during this first pass. And so these are very fast ECG data GRE sequences, and it's a dynamic image acquisition obtained after gadolinium injection. And we usually obtain one image per heartbeat, an image between 50 to 200 heartbeats, depends on how fast the heart rate is. And stress MRI, we don't do it very often, but that is a good alternative to stress nuclear medicine tests, as this test would not involve any radiation. And then another key sequence in any cardiac MRI would be the delayed enhancement or the late gadolinium enhancement, as is more popularly referred to these days. And in this example, you can see that the normal myocardium is black here, but you can see the myocardium within the anterior and lateral wall is thinned out and is abnormally bright. 
And you can confirm this finding on the other views, on the VLA and also on the Fort Schlipper view. And that is due to a previous myocardial infarction in the LAD and circumflex territory, so that you, you result in thinning and scar development of the myocardium. <coughs> So the scar and the inflammation of the hands <coughs> Sorry about that. I have I have two kids at home and I swear that they brew some super bugs. <laughs> Patients have aliasing, 
which the movie is not working. But imagine this movie that if you see uh, the white circle and then in the middle you have a very intense black jet, then that would be what aliasing looks like. And if you see that, you should recognize that and then go up on your bank. Because otherwise it would affect the, the accuracy of the calculations. If you didn't notice it at the time, we can perform some phase unwrapping to, to salvage it a little bit, but there's a limit to that. We can only salvage up to about two times of your bed. So if you set your bed to be way too low, then we wouldn't be able to salvage that. And then afterwards, again, you can contour around the vessel, and then using the modified Bernoulli equation, you can calculate the pressure gradient, and you can quantify the flows. And for the last bit, we're going to talk about some newer sequences that are that are more uh, research or some of it is becoming more mainstream. So the T2 star mapping is used for direct quantitative measurement of the T2 star time of the tissue. It can detect ion deposition, which causes signal loss as long as TE times. And ion deposition can lead to heart failure in patients with multiple transfusions due to either underlying sickle cell disease or beta thalassemia or patients who just have too much iron in their bodies due to problems with iron metabolism, such as patients with primary hemochromatosis. So this is a patient with sickle cell disease. As you can see, just subjectively, the heart is not squeezing quite well. But when you do this T2 star mapping and you look at the images going from a low TE to a high TE, the myocardium is getting progressively blacker due to the presence of iron. Another thing that we can quantify is tissue fibrosis through T1 mapping. So the T1 mapping has a 180 degree inversion of the spins and then sample the signals after different inversion times. You can basically do this analysis on anybody uh, who comes through with your TI scout, or you can do a more dedicated sequence with the modified root blocker on MOLLE sequences. The MOLLE sequences are felt to be a little bit better because they do freeze some cardiac motion. And this is how it's done. So basically you take that stack of TI scout and MOLLE sequences in which you have the different TI times and then you, you do the measurements and then it can draw the curve and then that can give you an estimate of the intrinsic key one time of the tissues. And this is how you would do it for Molly. The Molly, the, the images tend to be a little crisper, so you may get better numbers. And you can also quantify the amount of edema through T2 mapping. So these are tend to be more reliable than just looking at the dark blood images because they have a less artifact prone. These are basically bright blood sequences that use varied T2 times preparation types to sample the T2 weighting of the tissues. And it may be helpful in myocarditis or acute infarct to identify the presence of edema. So obviously these are dark blood images. You can sort of see that it's a little bit brighter. And here it is on the T2 map. And I mean, come on, they come in color. So anything is better with color. So this T2 mapping is also nice in that. So cardiac MRI is a useful non-invasive test for evaluation of the heart. Imaging of patients with cardiac MRI requires a basic knowledge of cardiac anatomy and pulse sequences. And newer MRI sequences are becoming available that allow for quantitative evaluation of tissue.